scripture here. Well, let's begin with a psalm. We're going to Psalm 119. I love to pray the psalms over the service. We're going to verse 41. As always, the invitation is open. I would love to have you guys come up here and read the psalm. Uh, So if that is something you would like to do, please let me know. Psalm 119, verse 41. As I've said before, Psalm 119 is this super long psalm. It's because it's an acrostic poem going through the whole Hebrew alphabet. We are on the letter Vav this weekend, and it says this in verse 41. Let your faithful love come to me, Lord, your salvation as you promised. Then I can answer the one who taunts me, for I trust in your word. Never take the word of truth from my mouth, for I hope in your judgments. I will always obey your instruction forever and ever. I will walk freely in an open place because I study your precepts. I will speak of your decrees before kings and not be ashamed. I delight in your commands, which I love. I will lift up my hands to your commands, which I love, and will meditate on your statutes. Pray with me. Father, as we talk about a challenging topic today, Lord, the topic of rejection, Lord, I ask that you remind us that we are not rejected by you. Lord, we have been accepted as sons and daughters of your kingdom. Lord, you have said to us that you promise good to us, you promise salvation to us, you promise redemption You promise that we will reign and rule with you in your kingdom for all eternity. Help but remind us of our identity in you, Lord, for it is only when we know you truly, when we know you fully, when we trust you, that we can face the rejection we often experience in the world. Lord, you are an awesome God. Give us strength like the psalmist here who is daring enough to go before kings and speak truth unashamed. God, let us go into the open streets. Let us go home in our, to our homes with our families and, and never be ashamed of proclaiming who you are, what you've done for us, Lord, because you are indeed an awesome God. I pray this in your name, the name of Jesus. Amen. So this morning, as you can probably tell from my prayer, we're going to be talking about rejection. Rejection. We're going to be in Matthew chapter 13 and verse 53, so you can go ahead and go there right away. One of the things that I've had to learn to become okay with as a pastor is rejection. Is rejection. It's, it's one of the things that happens probably more often than anything else in my own personal life is rejection. It's a challenge. When my, when my family, actually I'll, I'll start here. Yesterday I was at my sister's wedding uh, uh, doing, doing her wedding. My wife was in the ceremony. I was presiding over the ceremony, which was just awesome. Uh, but I got to see a ton of people that I grew up with that were her friends that I knew that came from out of state and, and, and flew in. And I was reminded of the feeling of rejection a little bit. You see, because everybody in my family, extended family, uh, friends knows that I am a pastor. They know that this is what I do. And it's amazing to see how in some situations that has changed the dynamic of the relationship that I have with those people, right? They know that this is what I do, so they make assumptions about who I am supposed to be or how I'm supposed to behave or what I might say to them if they say the wrong thing or, or whatever else. And, and there's this overwhelming feelings of times of, of they don't see me when they see me, they see Pastor Drew, Right? They see Pastor Drew, and so they respond and act differently. It's a type and a feeling of rejection. I've had to learn to get especially good at this when I just go out to random public places, like, for example, when you go get a haircut, right? Uh, I am starting to bald back here, but I'm not quite there yet. Uh, I promise Bree, once it starts going, it's going all the way. I will be bald at, <laughs> at some point. Uh, uh, there won't be any comb over here. Uh, it'll, it'll be gone. But I still do go get a haircut, and as I go to get a haircut, of course, one of the first questions they ask you, what do you do for work, right? It's just small talk, it's just what you do, and you never know how the next part of that conversation is going to go, 
<laughs> Brian and I have talked about this a few times. Luckily, he's also a school counselor. Uh, so what do you do for work could just answer, I'm a school counselor. <laughs> and doesn't have to bring up the second part. For me, I'm going to be honest. I'm laid out there. Oh, I'm a pastor. A lot of the times the reaction's positive, but you really never know. And, and when someone has sharp scissors right by your jugular, you know, it, it does change the dynamic of the conversation. Sometimes it's been just complete awkward silence as they cut my hair, not wanting to say anything or the wrong thing or, or whatever else. And sometimes it's been an amazing conversation. I remember one time I was at the dentist years ago, and the lady, the nurse that was working there and, and helping, helping out with the doctor, we got into an hour-long conversation about God at the dentist office where I was just sitting in this chair, <laughs> which, by the way, when you go to the dentist, you're like, get me out of this place as fast as possible. But she asked, right, what do you do for work? And so I talked about it. Well, she had a pretty traumatic past relationship with Christians in the church as a whole. She grew up Catholic as a young girl, actually in Mexico, and she was telling me this story. She went to Catholic boarding school, and she herself was molested by the priest um, that presided over the school. She knew many other fellow students who were also molested by the same priest. And she was telling me stories of, of how, you know, when, when she would go and do something that was deemed as out of line, how he would drag them into a room and, and, and beat them first um, and, and then molest them afterwards. And so she was telling me this traumatic story. And, and all of that just came out of me saying that I was a pastor. And now here she is just, just laying it all out there. And so she's telling me this, and she goes, I just want you to know, I, I don't believe in God. I don't believe in the Jesus that you preach. I, I've just seen what that makes people become, but I really appreciate getting to tell you all of this and have you listen. And, and we talked for an hour, and it was just, it was a great conversation. I don't know where she is now, but it's amazing how sometimes when you go out into the world and you're honest with who you are in Christ, the response that you can get. But the only way you're going to get there with people is if you're okay with being rejected. Is if you're okay with being rejected. For me, it's on my conscience that I'm always going to speak truthfully. So if someone asks me what I do, I'm just going to say the truth. So it puts me in that situation. For you, you're not pastors. Well, maybe you are, but uh, you're not pastors. But when you're put in an environment, you have an opportunity. Are you going to step up to the challenge and say, I'm all right? If the person I'm speaking to rejects me entirely after I say what I'm about to say. Because I might get into the most amazing, meaningful, powerful, life-transforming, gospel conversation with this person. Right? It's worth it. But you have to be okay with rejection or you'll never get there. You'll never get there because you'll just avoid the conversation. Today we're going to be looking at how Jesus was, was not just okay with rejection, but embraced rejection. Embraced the reality that as the Son of God, as the Messiah, people were not going to always respond positively to his message. The things that he had to say were true, and therefore they were hard to accept. They were hard to digest. They challenged people to their core. But he was never afraid of rejection because he knew who he was sent by. He knew the Father. He knew his mission. He knew the truth. So come with me to Matthew chapter 13, verse 53, as we pick up at the end of this parable series, right before we move into our new series on the kingdom starting next weekend. It begins in verse 53 of chapter 13, and it says this. When Jesus had finished these parables... He left there and he went to his hometown and began to teach them in their synagogue. One uh, piece of information that is often missed when we talk about the ministry of Jesus, Jesus was in the synagogue every Saturday, preaching and teaching to the people in the church. Uh, I, I bring that up because a lot of people have a picture of Jesus that he, he refused to in any way associate with the church. He was just out doing miracles and healing out in the public. But no, every Saturday, Jesus was preaching in the church. When you read this, which we will in a minute, in Luke, it says this was his routine. This was just what he did. He went to church every Saturday and he preached. So he goes home and he goes into the synagogue as he always does and he teaches he teaches so that they were astonished, amazed, and said, where did this man get this wisdom 
and these miraculous powers. Now here's, there's going to be a little turn here. And I just want you to notice it, right? Verse 55. Isn't this the carpenter's son? I want to stop there for a second. The word carpenter there, it actually has a more general meaning of just builder. Just builder. Jesus was a builder. In fact, more than likely, him and his dad built houses together. That was their career. And so he grew up in, in, in a household of a builder and became a builder himself. Uh, you know, contrary to popular belief, builders were not lower class individuals. Builders were actually middle class individuals, much like they are today. My good friend John, our, our beloved contractor, right? <laughs> who helped build this whole building, is a builder, just like Jesus. <laughs> He's going to hate me that I said that out loud to everybody, but that's okay. But Jesus was a builder. He built houses. Now, I can't think of anything more perfect than the fact that the God who created the whole universe, when he became a man, became a builder. <laughs> I just, it just, it's just the perfect thing. But it's just amazing. Jesus is a builder, and these people hear his preaching and his teaching. This, they, they grew up around him. They knew who he was, and they said, wait a second. He has all these miraculous powers. He has all this wisdom, but, but isn't this that, that builder's son? Right? Isn't his mother called Mary and his brothers, James, Joseph, Simon, and Judas? Not that Judas, by the way. It's a common name, different Judas. Verse 56, and his sisters, aren't they all with us? So where does he get all these things? Notice verse 57, and they were offended by him. Right? Where does it begin? Jesus comes into town to his hometown of Nazareth. He goes into the synagogue, as he always does on Saturday, to preach and to teach. He's preaching and teaching, and the people begin with amazement, awe. They're hearing the very word of God. Jesus is, is giving them wisdom that they just never got. Week in and week out, they never heard it. And now they're getting this amazing wisdom. And more than that, Jesus is healing and doing amazing things, which we've been reading about for weeks. And so they ask the obvious question, what happened to him? He's, he's got this amazing ability to preach and teach. He's healing people. Isn't that the builder's son? And then the tone changes, right? Oh, Mary's son. Oh, wait, his brothers. And notice that they name them all, right? And they start listing them out. His sisters, they're with us, probably married to many of these individuals. Those are our wives. Those are our, our, our family. So wait a second. What makes him so special? right? Where did he get all these things? We know who his family is. What makes him? And then that turns into, who does he think he is? Right? Who does this guy think he is? And then that turns into, I'm offended that he would even dare come try to preach to us when I know who his family is, right? It's classic rejection. Come with me to Luke Luke tells a very similar story of the same event, but he gives us a little bit more details in Luke chapter 4, verse 16. I'm just going to read through the whole thing in one shot, and then we'll talk about it, because it gives us a little bit more of a picture of what happens here. Verse 16, he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. Notice this, I just said this. As usual, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, and unrolling the scroll, he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He has sent me to, pro to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. He then rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of everyone in the synagogue and the church were fixed on him. And he began by saying to them, Today, as you listen, this scripture has been fulfilled. What's he saying? I'm the promised Messiah. I'm here. This passage in Isaiah you just handed me, it's about me. Here I am. Verse 22. They were all speaking well of him and were amazed by the gracious words that came from his mouth. Yet they said, 
isn't this Joseph's son? This is dad. Isn't this the builder's kid? Then he said to them, no doubt you will quote this proverb to me, doctor, heal yourself. What we've heard that took place in Capernaum, do it here in your hometown also. In other words, hey, all those miracles we've been hearing about, time to show up, buddy. All right? Time to dish them out. We got people that need healing. He also said, truly I tell you, no prophet is accepted in his hometown. But I say to you, there were certainly many widows in Israel in Elijah's day, an Old Testament prophet, when the sky was shut up for three years and six months, while a great famine came over the land, and yet Elijah was not sent to any of them except a widow at Zarephath and Sidon. And in the prophet Elisha's time, another Old Testament prophet, there were many in Israel who had leprosy, and yet not one of them was cleansed except Naaman the Syrian. Now I want to give you a picture of what's happening here. Jesus is looking at two Old Testament prophets, primary prophets, Elijah and Elisha, where there are several chapters about both of them and their prophetic ministry. And Jesus is saying to the people in his hometown, these guys, they were rejected when they came home because no prophet is ever welcome in their hometown. Why might that be? I know that guy. I watched him grow up and now he dares to tell me what God has to say. Who does he think he is? I'm older than him. I'm wiser than him. I've been around longer than him. I changed his diaper growing up, and now he dares to challenge me with the word of God. What nerve, right? Prophets are never welcome in their hometown, and then Jesus drops a bomb on them. He brings up these two prophets, and he brings up two of their healings, some of the miracles that they did. Now, here's the key to this story. Both of the people... Elijah and Elisha heal these stories are not Israelites. They're not Israelites. In other words, the prophets are not healing people that belong to them. They're healing Gentiles, people of the nations. And Jesus is saying something even more than that. There's this huge famine that Elijah causes by his prayers. God could have sent Elijah to feed the Israelites during this time and give them food. He doesn't. He sends him to one woman with her child. And that woman happens to be what? A member of the nations. Meaning in the midst of a great famine, God chose to provide to someone that wasn't uh, uh, belonging to the people of God and not to the Israelites. He brings up another story of a great prophet who did the very same thing with Naaman the Syrian. There were many Israelites struggling from leprosy, but God decided to heal Naaman who was godless and go out and healed him in the river, in the Jordan River. What's Jesus doing? Remember they demanded, hey, I heard all those miracles you've been doing everywhere. Time to pay up, buddy. And what does Jesus say? Hey, no prophet's ever welcome in his hometown. Here's two examples. And look at this. They chose to heal, but they didn't heal the people from their own. Right? Who'd they heal? They healed others. The people that were demanding the signs, the people who had the hard hearts, they passed them by. So what's he saying? I'm not healing any of y'all. Because that's not what I'm here for. And now notice the response. Verse 20, when they heard this, everyone in the synagogue was enraged. They got up, drove him out of town, brought him to the edge of the hill that their town was built on and intended to hurl him over the cliff. But he passed right through the crowd and went on his way. His message is so challenging that they just right then and there say, we're going to kill you. And they drag him out to the top of the town and intend to throw him off and kill him right then and there. This is the core of rejection, isn't it? I don't know about you guys, but I've always had a, a great relationship with my family, and we've always been this this tribe, right? We do everything together. And growing up, we've done everything together. And in my adult life, I go... Every weekend, I'm going to do it today, after church on Sunday, and my wife and I and my little girl, we all go over to my parents' house, and we hang out and eat dinner and play games. It's just what we do. We've been a close-knit family. Can you imagine showing up to, to people who have been close to you forever, who have, been, who have been part of your life for as long as you can remember, and you come and you bring the word of truth, and the response to that is so angry. So much rejection, it's like, let's toss this guy off a cliff. Let's find the nearest place to kick this guy in a ditch. 
Jesus is experiencing the most severe rejection that there is. But he faces it for a reason. Let's, let's walk into this next piece in our passage in Matthew 13. We just left off with they were offended by him, and we saw in Luke how that played out. Jesus says, a prophet is not without honor except in his hometown and in his household. And then here's this final piece, and this is where we'll focus for the last bit of the sermon today. Verse 58, and he did not do many miracles there because of their unbelief. Right? We just saw that whole story. I'm not doing anything for y'all because I know your hearts. It was because of their unbelief. Now, when you walk through the stories of Jesus' life over and over and over again, what you're going to see is people who are so drawn to him and, and so believe in his message and, and, and the power to transform their lives that they come to him, right? The foremost story that I think of is, is the, the, the disabled guy and his four buddies, right? And they bring him up onto the top of the house and they dig the roof of the house out and they lower him down. Like, you got to heal this guy, right? I know what you can do. I think of this centurion and his servant, right? Coming out publicly, kneeling and pleading with Jesus, calling him Lord, which was as controversial as controversial got, and asking him, Lord, I know you can heal him. Not only do I know you can heal him, you can heal him with just a word. We see this over and over and over again. People believe, they come to Jesus, they plead with him, and Jesus heals. There are other stories, very few of them, but there are some stories where Jesus just heals. Where there isn't someone who just comes and intercedes, but he just heals. He's healing all of these people and he provides healing, but that is the rarity. More often than not, the people come to him and he heals. So something about this is so interesting to me. They didn't get healed there because of their unbelief. What does that tell you? They were so angry. They were so mad at his message because they knew who he was growing up that they refused to even go to God to receive healing. I would rather stay a cripple than go to you, right? I would rather be blind than have this kid I grew up with be the one to heal me. That's the heart. The rejection is so severe that people end up hurting themselves. They have a source of healing and life right in front of them, but they're so blinded by their anger and the rejection that they just don't even go. But here's another thing I want to present to you that I think speaks the heart of Jesus and I think challenges us in the way we experience rejection. Do you remember back a few chapters ago, and I'm going to go there, Matthew chapter 11, verse 20, before we begin the value series, as we were going through um, the story of, of John the Baptist, and we were going through all Jesus' healings in the Chain Breaker series, we came to this verse, and it was one of the hardest weekends I had to preach because it's one of the hardest passages in, in this section. You see, Jesus had done all of these amazing miracles town after town, healing leprosy, healing the blind, healing the sick, raising people from the dead. But then you get this tragic note right there. Verse 20, it says this, Jesus is the one doing this. Then he proceeded to denounce the towns where most of his miracles were done because they did not repent. Right? That is like gut-wrenching to me. Jesus goes through all these towns and he does all this miraculous stuff. He's healing and doing so many amazing things and they still don't believe. They still don't turn. They still reject him. And he begins here to denounce all of these people he did all these amazing things for because they saw, they experienced the power of God, and they still rejected the message. There's nothing left. There's nothing left for them. If they've been healed, if they've been transformed, and they still don't believe, what else can you do, right? And he denounces these towns. So here's the other angle I'm coming at with this passage that we're reading here where he doesn't do many miracles. Is there a level of grace here? Is there some mercy playing out here? In other words, Jesus knows that they're not going to believe. And he also knows that if he heals them and they don't believe, that the accountability 
that they have before God goes from here to here. It wasn't just a message, right? I healed you. You were lame for years and now you're walking and you still don't believe. What excuse are you possibly going to have before the throne of God when I was here walking, preaching, teaching, and healed you? So is there, is there a little bit of mercy here? I know your heart, so I'm not going to heal because if I do, it's going to make it worse for you. One of the things that I just want to challenge us on for all of us, it's going to be hard at times to do this, but it's super important. I think, and I want to be careful the way I say this, but I, I believe this. There are times when it's not the right time for you to tell someone about Jesus. All right? I want to be careful in the way I say that because my earnest desire is for everyone to believe and to know who Christ is and to know the gospel. And I know that's your heart as well. But I'm telling you, there are situations where it's more merciful to hold back when someone has rejected the message over and over and over and over again and to say, I'm going to trust this person to the Lord. And I'm going to start praying. But maybe it's time for me to step away a little bit. Because the message and what I'm bringing to them is not coming through. And my concern is the more and more I preach to them, the more and more accountable they become. I think there's something here with that. Jesus doesn't do the miracles. He doesn't heal. Because there's a level of, if they do this and they don't believe, there's an accountability before God now. But here's the other challenge. I just want to invite you in for a second. Your role... It's to speak truth at work, at home, with your family, to speak truth, to speak the gospel. And not be afraid of the rejection that will come afterwards. But here's the key. You are not responsible for whether or not someone believes. Right? You're responsible to, to speak truth, to speak the gospel, to represent Christ. You're not responsible if they believe or don't believe. Jesus himself goes into his hometown. The Son of God goes into his hometown and receives rejection. What should we expect? When we're not perfect and our upbringing and the places we grew up, we did some things we're not so proud of, right? Where Jesus was, never had to apologize for something he did in high school or whatever else, right? We're not that way. You and I aren't that way. We've got plenty of things to apologize for. If the perfect son of God goes into these environments and he's rejected, what should you expect, right? You are not responsible. You cannot force the people you love into the kingdom of God. Can't do it. These people were so resistant to the message, they refused to even go receive healing from God because of the person that was preaching the message. That will happen where you're speaking truth in your family with your friends and they'll reject the message just because you're the one saying it. And to me, I think that's the time you say, I'm going to take a step back and I'm going to pray that the Lord brings someone into their life that isn't me who's going to speak that truth in a way they can hear it. Right? But the challenge is knowing when that right time is. If you're somebody who has never said a word to your family about Christ, you're in the wrong right now. You're in the wrong. I, you can't say you love somebody and know the stakes of their eternal life and not bring the message of truth to them. You can't do it. You can't do it because that's not love. That's not love, right? You can't look at someone you care about and go, I'm just totally okay if they go to hell. It's just totally fine with me. I, and so because I'm so afraid of rejection, I ain't going to say a word. It's totally cool. Go off. You know, that's fine. That isn't love, right? We, we got to speak the truth. But sometimes it comes to a point where if you love somebody, especially someone that's close to you and they're rejecting it because they're stumbling over who's telling them and it's you, the loving thing to do then is to say, okay, because I love the Lord and I'm going to trust him to you and I'm not going to be in your way, right? To knowing who Jesus is. See what I'm saying? But it all begins with understanding that our Lord 
knows what rejection is like. And when we're rejected, we know that we're accepted in the family of God. It's that fallback. It's that ability to say, I'm okay if my family rejects me because I have a family in Christ. I have brothers and sisters in Christ. I have friends and loved ones who I know I'm spending eternity with, so I'm okay being rejected because I can fall back with them. Pray with me. Lord Jesus, as we go into our lives and in our homes, God, with our family, with our friends, with our coworkers, Lord, I just ask that by your spirit you would challenge us, Lord. God, if we have not spoken the message of truth, the gospel, as you've called us to speak, God, move on our hearts with the spirit so strongly that we cannot even resist but telling the truth and speaking about you. God, also give us courage to trust you. Trust you enough to be okay with rejection. Trust you enough to be able to step back from the people we love and say, Lord, they're in your hands. Give us strength to do that. That That's one of the hardest things, to look at family, friends, and be able to say, I have to give them to Jesus because I can't be their savior. But Lord, give us the strength. Give us the courage. Give us the faith. Lord, you're an awesome God. Pray all this in the name of Jesus. Amen.